Hi, my name is Grant Kiniski, and this is my 2020 Master of Architecture thesis for the University of Cincinnati, under the guidance of advisors Michael McInturf and Liz Rorden. The goal of the discrete architectural interventions of this thesis is to provide a methodology for the analysis of parks and the designing of low-cost, human-scaled interventions that aim to subtly address the problems produced by the infamous San Francisco housing crisis by increasing the utility of the existing parks of the city during the winter months. The final interventions focus mainly on Fort Mason Park, a park that is in the Marina District, a district that has been struggling with gentrification from the techies in the past decade. Fort Mason Park boasts emblematic views of the Golden Gate Bridge and the San Francisco Bay. The park gathers people from all walks of life, tourists, cyclists, techies, creatives, and locals. The five human-scaled interventions were developed by iterating and developing human-scaled forms that respond to five key fundamental spatial characteristics that organize all parks. The five characteristics or spatial topologies are defined as frame, enclosure, path, field, slope. These interventions promote passive recreation within San Francisco parks with the aim to create public living spaces for the population that lacks personal living spaces. Before intervening as specifically as the images you just saw, I researched tactical urbanism and the ways this movement intervenes publicly and discreetly within an urban environment. Tactical urbanism is often low-cost interventions that are enacted incognito by the citizens as a way of enriching their public spaces. These ideas propose a democratized community-first approach to the creation and designing of public spaces. Solowit is a great example of a designer that develops a methodology of design rules and iteration to drive a set of geometric forms. Solowit provided detailed instructions for the construction of his wall drawings and sculptures. The postmodern sculpture of the 60s and 70s created a purity of form and space. The human-based scales of the designs brought sculpture into the world of architecture. They were now architecture objects that people can inhabit. Some of the key artists, sculptors, and architects were Tony Smith, Bernard Schumi, Robert Morris, Sol LeWitt, Donald Judd, and Robert Irwin. Tony Smith was a key example of one of the postmodern sculptors that really broke down the boundaries between architecture and sculpture. He created sculptures that were meant to be inhabited and put in public spaces. In this inhabitable sculpture, Tony Smith uses the proportions of a 6x8 cube as a way of making a reference to common architectural standards such as the height of a door. I think Tony Smith's work is summed up well in a discussion he had with Robert Morris. Sculptor Robert Morris asked him, why didn't you make it larger so that it would loom over the observer? I was not making a monument, was Smith's reply. Then why didn't you make it smaller so that the observer could see over the top, Morris persisted. I was not making an object. I think this conversation illustrates Smith's delicate use of scale. Robert Morris developed a form class, which is a series of iterations of similar geometric traits. That means aggregation, repetition, and changing the orientation of the objects. Robert Morris defined complex spaces with simple forms. Bernard Schumi popularized the idea of unprogrammed architectural spaces. His Follies in his 1984 Parc des Villettes created a series of autonomous design rules within a datum grid system which provided design constraints that allowed him to apply these concepts to the brownfield he was provided. Contemporary architects often develop meaning through an analysis of the site which they apply to their architectural and material applications. Frank Havermans uses a strictly hand modeling process and he works autonomously. Frank Havermans increases in scale until he finally reaches his full scale intervention. 
Havermans creates and builds low-cost human-scaled interventions within a variety of environments. In Luminous Drapes, Studio Toggle applies anthropometric analysis and drawing to drive their design method and their spatial organization. Studio Toggle then used lighting and modularity to express each of the different modes of activity they identified in the drawings earlier. San Francisco's housing crisis has created a variety of architectural conditions, such as an abundance of luxury housing and a lack of affordable housing. The continuing migration of tech workers have pushed out people that once made the city so diverse, and the locals are struggling daily with the effects of this push. Renting a room is standard for professionals living in the city, and many do not offer living rooms or communal spaces for gathering. This results in much of the population being limited to just their personal box, their room. The displacement of San Francisco's diversity has created a distaste within the native population. This distaste is towards tech companies and their growing influence on art, architecture, and culture. This thesis introduces a set of analog influence design processes that develop and define quantifiable methods of analysis, iteration, and intervention within San Francisco parks. Meet Sam. He lives bayside along a 1997 Catalina 30 sailing boat. Sam waited two years for his slip, and now the waiting list is up to 10 years. And that's because he pays $250 for a liveaboard fee and $250 for a slip fee, a total of $500 a month. Sam frequents and relies on his nearby park, the James Herman Cruise Terminal. He uses the space to take his dog out, to meet with friends, and to skateboard. Meet Eric. He lives in a standalone garage. Eric's garage is not zoned for residential use, but he still has a lovely dwelling inside of it. He lives with his family rent-free. Eric lives around the corner from Fort Mason Park and has defined that park as his living room. He uses it for large meetups, dates, skateboarding, relaxing, reading, and practicing his guitar. Michelle lives in a lofted bedroom inside of a warehouse, non-compliant with fire codes. She pays $600 in cash a month for rent. She frequents Dolores Park as her nearby waiting spot, meeting spot, hanging spot, a spot to play her guitar, read her book, meditate, and a spot to just live. The city has sacrificed living spaces for density, which in turn reinforces the need for the communal spaces that the San Francisco parks provide. San Francisco's 220 parks provide green spaces for passive recreation and gathering. San Francisco's parks are commonly populated year-round, full of people exercising, playing games, gathering, drinking, reading, playing music, and so on. These lively green spaces are one of the trademarks of the outgoing city. This need for a space to gather does not get filled in the winter months when the wind and rain pick up and the sun sets early, making the once friendly park seem dark and uninviting. The natural transformation into winter is one that decreases the quality of life for those who rely on the park and are living in tight rooms without any communal space to gather. As I pulled together a catalog of parks to possibly intervene within, I created a set of rules. I was looking for parks that lacked architectural and artistic identities, parks that range in social, spatial, and architectural qualities, parks that are situated within a dense urban context, and parks that provide the local community with living spaces. Once I compiled a list of parks that I thought were iconic of San Francisco, I settled upon the three parks. The three parks were Fort Mason Park in the marina, the James Herman Cruise Terminal in North Beach, and the Mission Dolores Park in the Mission. I documented the three parks I had chosen and started to understand the activity that goes on within the park. Dolores Park is an incredibly popular park in San Francisco and is frequently populated with people from different walks of life. I chose this site because it acts as a social space that people go to to gather, meet, and be active. The park has a steep hillside topography that slopes in the direction of the skyline. The park is connected to the circulatory system of the city and directly connects to the streetcar line. The park's lower section is a flat field that lacks a skyline view and promotes physical activity, while the upper section of the park is sloped looking down on the activity-packed field prompting a more relaxed, voyeuristic engagement with the park. The diversity of spatial cues and their organization impacts the various modes of social engagement in Dolores Park. The James Herman Cruise Terminal at Pier 27 in North Beach, San Francisco, is a park that is frequently populated by tourists and skateboarders. Visitors and passers-by enjoy the panoramic views of the San Francisco Bay, Treasure Island, the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, the Financial District, Telegraph Hill, and Coy Tower. 
The plaza is along the Embarcadero, prompting a steady flow of pedestrian traffic. The plaza is a popular meeting ground for skateboarders who utilize the smooth parking lot for the cruise terminal. The plaza is transformed every Tuesday as a cruise ship arrives, flooding the city with new tourists. The only time the skateboarding is not permitted is when a cruise ship is docked in the bay. The interventions of this thesis are developed in full for Fort Mason Park in the Marina District, San Francisco. The meandering paths and grassy lawns offer stunning views of the emblematic Golden Gate Bridge. The park is frequented by cyclists, walkers, and runners. The park is a meeting place for dog groups, yoga groups, frisbee groups, and many other informal and formal groups. The flat grass field offers a space for open. The park offers a great view of the bay and provides an ideal viewing experience for the Blue Angel Air Show every fall. The park's historic background was one of constant change, supplementing the various naval demands for the U.S. Navy. This park fills up every day with tourists who rent bikes in the famous Fisherman's Wharf and follow the Bayside Embarcadero Trail, which passes directly through Fort Mason Park. The park is poorly lit at night, making the paths dangerous for cyclists and pedestrians. This reputation as the tech hangout place has prompted some natives to stay away from the park entirely. The inspiration for winter interventions within parks came to me when I was hanging out in Fort Mason Park on a typical Sunday afternoon in January. As I hung out in the park until dark, I watched everyone leave the park as the sun set. And then I realized that the utility of these parks are just no longer there when the sun is gone. I began with looking at the San Francisco housing crisis, which led me to look into the increase in urban density and property prices, which in turn led to room renting and the extinction of living spaces. The city's loss of living spaces creates a reliance on the public parks for living spaces. Public parks in San Francisco are unable to provide the living spaces that are needed during the winter due to lack of infrastructure and lighting. In response to those problems, discrete architectural interventions can provide the needed utility in the winter and reinforce fundamental organizational properties of the park. To mindfully intervene within an existing park, I looked at the parks through an architectural lens. I broke the parks down into five fundamental topologies that organize a park spaces. Frame, the intentional framing of an emblematic or significant view, through the use of foliage, thresholds, angle, direction, slopes, branded signs, light posts, benches, and a park's orientation. Enclosure, a sense of enclosure. Groupings of trees, density of planters, man-made canopies, pavilions, and adjacent buildings. Path, the circular character of the park, defined by benches, signs, slopes, foliage, and adjacent trees. Field. The stage for activity within the park, a level and open grass field defined by paths, program, and surrounding streets. Slope provides, provides boundaries and an elevated perspective of the space, defined by paths and the surrounding context. I looked at these three parks through the lens of these five spatial topologies as a means of understanding their spatial organizational systems. I looked at how the central palm trees frame the skyline of the city and how the foliage around the park's borders is used to frame the surroundings and the vistas that the park provides. I looked at how a dense cluster of short palm trees can create an enclosure within the park and allow for more private gatherings. I looked at how the park utilized benches and palm trees as a way of defining paths, observed how the level grass field creates a stage for activity, while the slopes of the park look down onto the level plains of grass. The James Herman Cruise Terminal uses more hardscaping techniques than the other two parks. This plaza uses steel H-columns and I-beams to create a consistent design language within the site. The park defines its path with handrails and large curb cuts. The plaza uses a large glowing sign as a means to draw people from the Embarcadero path into the plaza. An elevated field puts the activity on a podium and increases the visibility from the path. In the final park, Fort Mason. Fort Mason is used as the main focus for the interventions because I found that this park is a clear example of all of these five topologies I have defined. The large palm trees that run through the center of the park frame the iconic Golden Gate Bridge. These central palm trees also provide a sense of enclosure for the inhabitants of the park, making people chase the shade as it moves across the grass. The paths are highly frequented by tourists, bikers, and other modes of transportation. The painted lanes, signs, and maps are placed as a means to manage the high volume of traffic. The large field that comprises the majority of the park creates a social stage for activity. 
The steeply sloped grass banks towards the edges of the park defined its boundaries. The initial designs of this thesis relied on a strictly analog design process. The process involved sketching, hand drafting while model making, and finally a digital visualization into the site. This design methodology relied on analog means as a way of iterating geometry and testing scale. The first study was titled Waypoint. The study focused on the path within the park and the relationship it had to the park. The study used simple geometric objects and aggregated them as a way of creating wayfinding points along the path. The idea came from improving visibility and safety at night for the cyclist who pass by, a problem that frequently arose for me when biking along this path. The next study was approaching the open field of the park. This study looked at the flat open topography that makes up the majority of the park. This planner intervention creates elevated levels for people to put their activity on display for the park. This intervention looked at situating itself adjacent to the central strip of palm trees. The large scale creates an object space and an enclosure. Using translucent stud framed walls with built in LED lights creates an inviting enclosure for nighttime gatherings. Box Cloud was thought to be within Dolores Park and intended to separate the click gatherings of the park. These interventions are most useful within the flat, green, lowest part of the park. The object is aggregated into three similar distinct objects that allow people to gather and create a space for their own group or themselves. The fifth study, SLICE, was intended to activate a steep central path that often goes unused as a gathering space. This intervention orients itself towards the skyline view and creates a small gathering space and a larger open gathering space with the intended modes of activity color-coded into the design. The sixth intervention, FACE, is situated at the James Herman Cruise Terminal. This intervention was meant to activate the elevated field and orient passers-by from the Embarcadero to the plaza. The form was also intended to frame the skyline and create a lit space that people can gather at at night. When beginning material studies, I was really interested in exploring full-scale lighting techniques with LEDs. Building a simple stud-framed wall with translucent trace paper and cheap programmable LED strips, I was able to create an effective means of lighting that is programmable and affordable. I then used 2x2 two two studs and oriented strand board to frame out the module that I was thinking about using for my final interventions. The oriented strand board is covered in acrylic roofing membrane and then painted in an exterior paint. The interventions would be raised on blocks as a means to promote water drainage. I made a large scale canvas and tested the color palette against each other. I used an 18 inch module to approach the designing of human scaled interventions. 18 inches is a common dimension that is frequently used in furniture design and construction. The modules have four main units. The first one is a simple two by two set of stud framing. The second one is the light with a 45 degree angled end. The third unit is a heavier module with two by four beams running across the top of the unit and 45 degree supporting braces. And the fourth unit is the reinforced unit with a 45 degree angled end to it. The materials are brought to the warehouse. The modules are fabricated they are then brought together by local community members in a variety of cars based on which modules fit in which cars the best. They are then brought to the site and placed according to the group's designs and clad with the materials and painted in their intended color codes. The interventions are intended to be designed and fabricated in November, built in December, inhabited January to March, disassembled for summertime and brought back to storage until the next winter. The affordable materials may have a lifespan of two to four interventions. The final interventions of this thesis utilize the five topologies and a sequential iterative design process. The parks are analyzed, the topologies are iterated, and an intervention is picked and cited. 
The frame permeations are forms that direct, orient, and frame the main view of the park. The final selection's activity is visualized, and a final selection is made for the frame topology. The enclosure permeations are forms that enclose, shelter, and shade, and are situated adjacent to the existing enclosures defined by the park. The enclosure forms are a good example of how the color coding works. The pastel colors define the larger planes, and the vibrant colors define the structural objects of the architecture. The final selections are between a handful of smaller scaled interventions that will fit nicely within an existing set of enclosure elements. The enclosure converts solar energy into LED lighting at night, which provides shelter from bad weather and shade on those surprisingly hot winter days. The path permeations are forms that direct, orient, and frame circulation along the essential path. While creating these permeations, they led me to explore their geometric evolution along a path. These interventions intend to create a visual cue for circulation and increase visibility and safety. The final permeation I chose was one that creates a beacon that directs and situates the inhabitant towards the entrance of a highly circulated path. At night, these interventions create a space for cyclists to briefly pull off and resituate for the long night ride ahead. The field permeations are forms that encourage the existing activity and attention that is implied within the central level field of a park. These iterations went from exploring ideas of benches, tables, to stages, and spaces. The final choice was one that created different levels of elevation as a means of creating different modes of engagement. At night, the glowing field intervention creates an inviting space that turns an empty, ominous, dark park into a glowing, inviting space. The slope permeations are rectilinear forms that are situated along a park's sloped grass spaces. The slope interventions intend to reinforce the elevation and voyeurism that comes with the slope spaces of the park. The final selection is one that creates a platform as well as an internal space for seating. The inside planes light up at night and create a warm space where you can look out over the park and the city. By simplifying architecture into three abstracted materials, solid, void, and translucent, it allows the meaning of the object to be derived from the user's engagement with the forms and the space they create, rather than the architectural tendency, which is to derive from an often esoteric relationship to the specific materials that are deployed, a meaning that is frequently missed by the average person. The dispersion of the defined five topologies throughout the site provide an organizational system that develops a cohesive set of architectural objects, objects that draw relationships from one object to the other, defining the negative space between the objects. This organizational iterative system is proposed as a methodology that can be applied to quantitatively analyze and intervene within most parks. This thesis began its investigations with the many architectural problems that plague San Francisco, architectural problems that stem from the ongoing housing crisis such as the extinction of living rooms and communal spaces in the majority of homes that rent rooms. A lack of communal living spaces has pushed the population to rely on their local neighborhood parks for living and gathering spaces. This dependence and loyalty San Franciscans have to their local neighborhood parks becomes a valuable phenomenon significant to the identity of San Francisco. And it is this phenomenon that this thesis studies and develops into a set of abstract architectural interventions as a way to discreetly ease the problems that plague the city.